On today's episode, we have the pleasure of speaking with oncologist Dr. Jose Sandoval. He has been kind enough to answer some of our most common questions, and as well as some of the questions uh, that have been posted leading up to today's event. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today, Dr. Sandoval. Fiona, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for the the honor and privilege to or you know me. Uh, be with here with you guys today, and thank you to Massive Bio and to all the folks who are uh, we're here with us tonight, uh, today. Again, my name is Jose Sandoval. I'm an assistant member of uh, the Malignant Hematology Department and the Cellular Therapy Department of Multi Cancer Center. Uh, uh, but I am actually based in uh, South Florida. I only see patients with lymphoid malignancies, more specifically, you know, uh, lymphomas. Uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and uh, I also do a stem cell transplant and CAR-T card, card cell therapy. Okay, that's excellent. Welcome, and um, thank you again for joining us. So we'll jump right in. Uh, can you give us an overview of lymphoma? Okay, that's a very broad question, but uh, we'll do our best. All right. So lymphoma are a malignant uh, cancers that they arise from a specific cells from their immune system, meaning your uh, sort of like your personal army, that is your immune system. Uh, they arise from some specific cells from these immune systems that are called lymphocytes. That, that, is, that where it's from the name of lymphoma comes from. These lymphocytes, there are different types of these lymphocytes. Some of them are called B lymphocytes that are the ones that produce antibodies, you know, to protect us against infections. There's another lymphocyte type uh, group that is called T lymphocytes that are the ones actually who fight against cancer cells or actually some uh, viruses as well. And there are some other special type of cells that are, they fall into this category of cells that are called natural killer cells or NK cells. Because there are a lot of these, like you, hear, like you just heard, there is a lot of types of uh, these lymphocytes. Uh, there is approximately like around 70 subtypes of these lymphomas and they are categorized from you know for where they're the origin for what what is the cell of origin of these lymphomas uh the least common of these uh uh there, there are two big groups of these uh, uh lymphomas one of them that is the less common group but uh you know ironically and good for the patients is the one that has probably been the most studied and most like sort of like a well-conducted clinical trials uh, that is called Hodgkin lymphoma. Those uh, for that that group of Hodgkin lymphoma, there are only five type of these Hodgkin lymphomas. Uh, they're less common, and all of them come from B lymphocytes. Okay, this Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, they're a little bit more common in young people, uh, but you are uh, you know between the ages of so between twenties and forties. Uh, but they also have a little bit of a, a rise at the end. You know. Uh, uh, later in life, when people, uh, when patients are above seventy-five years old, eighty years old. Now, the most common group of category of lymphomas are called when a, one of them is Hodgkin, the other one there are non Hodgkin lymphomas. Okay, and these are the ones that are more than seventy types of, or whatnot. Uh, they come from different type of cells. The most common ones are what we call B cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas, that there are around 80 to 85 percent of all non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Uh, T-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas, uh, there are about 10 to 15 percent of all these lymphomas. And the NK-cell uh, lymphomas, there are uh, one percent or less, which are usually are the ones that are more aggressive and more difficult to treat. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. It sounds like with all these different types of lymphomas, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for clinical trials and research and needed uh, opportunities. Can you um, share a little bit about lymphoma clinical trials? Absolutely. I mean, uh, lymphoma clinical trials are uh, abs have been uh, absolutely essential for the development of uh, curative uh uh, chemotherapy and immu immune therapy regimens, uh, they have, like I just said, that they nowadays they cure a lot of the patients, especially with the aggressive subtypes of, of lymphoma, such as Hodgkin lymphoma. And uh, one, the one that is more common of all lymphomas that is called diffuse large B cell lymphomas. 
uh, uh, before talking about clinical trials per se, I might, I might say something about, uh, uh, you know, about these, for example, B cell lymphomas, uh, Hodgkin lymphomas. We, that is one thing in medicine that we can cure. Okay. That we can cure with chemotherapy. Uh, uh not only uh, the first time around, but even the second time around. Now, uh, from the, the B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma standpoint, there are two very different groups and, uh, and a small group of lymphomas that I'm going to talk at the end about that is sort of like an intermediate, all right? So there's one spectrum of the disease that is called uh, aggressive B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas. And the most common one of those is uh, it's called diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, okay? Uh, even though we call it aggressive, we have nowadays and through the, through the use of clinical trials in the past 30 years, of 35 years or so, we have been able, nowadays, we are able to cure more or less two-thirds of patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And of course, there's a lot of caveats to that, but that is usually the ballpark numbers of that. Between 60 to 65% of patients can be cured. Uh, in the older, and there's another one that is very aggressive that is called Burkitt's lymphoma, that in those cases, even up to 75% or more of cases, we can cure with chemotherapy and immune therapy. Now, in the other side of the spectrum of B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas, there are these lymphomas that we call indolent B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma or sort of like slow-growing uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. A lot of times, these B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas, we don't have to treat because the patients, they simply, their uh, livelihood, their well-being, and their lifespan is not going to be affected by these lymphomas. However, sometimes we need to treat them. The sort of like a downside of that part is that these lymphomas are chronic diseases. They, we are not, uh, most of them, we're not uh, able to quote unquote cure the disease and make them go away forever. However, through the, you know, through the findings of many, many, many different clinical trials, uh, we have been able to get very effective therapies that actually can exert a very good control of the disease for many, many, many years. And in some cases, we're talking about functional cures, right? That somebody dies with the lymphoma, that not being able to really cure them, but from totally something else. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, we we're calling it now they potentially a uh, mechanistic or or a uh, you know functional cure. Now, all these advances. Oh wait, at one last uh, group of uh, B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma that is important to under uh, you know talk about, and it's one that has a little bit of both uh, spectrums. It's called m uh, mantle cell lymphoma, and it's important because we're going to talk about some clinical trials later on for this particular lymphoma. It has a little bit in the sense of these uh, n uh, slow growing lymphomas that sometimes at the beginning, for about you know up to twenty percent or a little bit more of patients, they don't have to be treated at the beginning. Uh, but unfortunately we, nowadays we still cannot say that we can cure mantle cell lymphoma. And in the other side, sometimes they can present very, in a very aggressive manner. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like one that we really need clinical trials and we're, you know, we are striving along with the multiple entities, with multiple organizations and societies to get more and more clinical trials to these end. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like. You know, with, with the advances in clinical trials, you know, you've been having great outcomes or there have been great outcomes and curative outcomes. So definitely um, we want to push for, you know, more participation um, in clinical trials. Um, and on that point, what what are the benefits uh, to participating, participating in a clinical trial versus receiving the standard of care treatment? Absolutely. So first of all, thinking a little bit better what clinical trials have, have given us in the area of lymphoma during the past, uh, again, more than 35 years or so, they gave us, uh, you know, uh, treatment changing medications, like for example, rituximab, that is an immunotherapy, okay, that I totally changed the, the story for our patients with uh, B-cell non Hodgkin lymphoma. Mm -hmm. uh, they gave us all these combo uh, regimens that I have been able to cure a lot of lymphomas, but especially Hodgkin lymphomas. And they recently gave us some other medications uh, that are called uh, antibody drug conjugates that are small little proteins of antibodies with a little bit of chemotherapy attached to it that also has been transformative for Hodgkin lymphomas and also gave us immune therapy. 
One of them that is very famous in solid tumors that are called checkpoint inhibitors, such as nivolumab or pembrolizumab that has been completely transformative in a uh, Hodgkin lymphoma and some other more strange lymphomas that are called primary mediastinal B cell lymphomas. So first of all, uh, and last but not least, one of my favorite treatments nowadays because it's really changed the, the life of a lot of patients when the lymphoma has come back, especially the aggressive ones, that are called CAR T cell therapy. Everything has been done through the uh, through the uh, avenue, I would say, that of clinical trials. So that's one of the important things about participating in clinical trials. Second of all, when a patient is is uh, nowadays with the type of clinical trials that we're that we are for the most part doing in, in lymphoma, a lot of patients, especially the ones that are called phase two randomized clinical trials or phase three randomized clinical trials, that I don't know if we're going to have to talk about a little bit, a little bit later on about what, you know, what, what type of trials there is in the, the art in oncology, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, but especially with the ones that are randomized, we are not, patients are not being randomized to placebo or to the non-active thing. They are always getting uh, one of the medications that is a standard of care, but we are adding uh, a new type of uh, intervention, being a medication or a procedure or whatnot to see how can we improve the life, the quality of life of patients and their survival of our patients, which is the main thing in, in these trials. These patients that participate in clinical trials, they are uh, selecting a way and that's something that needs to change. Uh, the, the, the NIH and the National Cancer Institute is actively working on that. There are very, it's a very select group of patients. We need to expand it more, right? We need to make yeah. it more democratic. But it's a very selective group of patients that are going to be followed very closely by their teams, not only by their not only by the physicians or their nurse practitioners or the nurses, but also by the pharmacists, by the clinical chart coordinators, and by a lot of different stakeholders that are, of course, uh, are investing a, a lot of effort uh, on for the patients or their family members to do really well, either on the active part of the clinical trial or on the control part of the clinical trial. Okay. So that's one of the benefits of that. The benefits is to get uh, access to potential changing treatments. Okay. Yeah. We have seen that from the very beginning. Uh, like I say, for example, rituximab is a very, very, very important medication that changed the life of different patients. And, you know, when uh, hearing stories about luminars in this, in this, uh, in this career, in, in, in my line of work, it would say that when they saw patients that they were not getting rituximab, they were seeing that. The excellent results were that we're seeing with rituximab. They're saying like, "Well, that's where the crossover to the other side is important for patients, right?" So, mm-hmm. uh, but that's how we know something is safe. A medication or intervention is safe, and we know it works to to meet the you know to meet the appropriate endpoints, the clinical important endpoints for a patient in you know college. Um, also, uh, you know, through participating in clinical trials, I think. It is important because in some instances, it, it gives the uh, uh, the opportunity uh, here in the United States and outside of the United States to some patients to have uh, sort of like, a, you know, prime, uh, so the best care possible that there is. Uh, here in the United States, gladly, it's not that common that we see that. I mean, uh, we, we, in general, we see that a lot of our patients get appropriate uh, appropriate care. Right, but uh, you'll be surprised, you know. And sometimes, so even in the states, but definitely in other parts of the world, sometimes and that's something that I hope in my life and will change for everybody. But sometimes we we don't get like the you know sort of like cutting edge uh, care that patients need. And sometimes, in some instances, also clinical trials that kind of help a little bit in in that area. Okay. Yeah. And in some instances, based on multiple different factors. There's some analysis that actually patients that participate in clinical trials or the ways from phase one clinical trials to phase three clinical trials actually have improved outcomes. Although that has different biases, especially with the selection of patients that we that not that should be different. And I totally agree on that. But uh um you know that they that's also an added benefit of, of participating in clinical trials. The in lymphoma and in other areas of oncology as well. Right, right. Yeah, I think we tend to forget about, you know, patients who don't have, you know, the best access in terms of um, treatments and healthcare. 
Um, so there are a few points there. You know, you could receive treatment that, you know, you may not receive due to where you live. Um, and also, you know, you're receiving a treatment that may not be available for years because it's in the clinical trial process. Um, so that's, you know, wonderful. The other thing that I wanted to point out, which you mentioned, is that, you know, you're followed very closely when you're part of a clinical trial, you know, more so than maybe you would be if you were receiving, you know, or not participating in a clinical trial. And in addition to that, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, again, is that uh, patients are not randomized to placebos. And I know that is some a concern for some patients, you know, that they don't want to be receiving a placebo, which I completely understand. And I think it's important to point out that a lot of clinical trials, especially on, in oncology, don't, you know, provide pr placebos for patients. So that is, you know, definitely a concern that patients have. And I'm glad that we were able to, you know, mention it here. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so here, you know, at Massive Bio, we encourage all physicians and patients to look into cl clinical trials so they have a clear understanding of all the available options. Um, do you, you know, is that something you offer to your patients? Do patients come to you for clinical trials? Or how does that work for you? Excellent question. So, uh, you know, the platforms like uh, Massive Bio that is pioneering this idea of using AI to find the best patient for the best clinic, meaning like, let me rephrase that, to find the best clinical trial for the appropriate patient at the right time uh, for the right disease, right? Uh, it is an excellent initiative, I believe, because uh, finding uh, clinical trials for patients, especially in very particular situations, is not easy, okay? Right. Uh, it's not easy, especially for small centers. And because, like you said, um, there, more than 80%, I would say around 85% or more of oncology care here in the United States is given by community PC, uh, oncologists, right? Which I absolutely admire them. Uh, in fact, my practice is sort of, it's a fusion between academics and, and, and community. So wh uh, when I see that, you know, I, I, um, when I see my colleagues that they treat all sort of tumors and also classic hematology cases or AKA, uh, you know, benign hematology, you know, I really admire them. But in getting clinical trials, uh, sometimes in the community is hard, right? It's yeah. hard because there's, there's uh, simply they're not available. There's not the inf infrastructure for that and so forth. And sometimes in big institutions, uh, well, there are not. We, there's a lot of clinical trials available, but there's probably not the uh, right trial for the right patient at the right time when they need it. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, that is that is part of this of a healthcare disparity. This lack to access to potentially cha game changer, potentially right, uh, clinical trials, mm -hmm. and that that's why uh, platforms like the one at Basic Bio, I think, is 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 very important. Massive Bio is not the only one that there's actually some other uh, uh, patient advocacy groups and so forth that have been working on that for a while. One of them is Leukemia Lymphoma Society, but it's a different type of approach, right? It's a different, right. uh, you know, it's not AI based and so forth and so on. Uh, I do think it's important. I uh, I sometimes talk to that about my patients to just, to just get educated in terms of these platforms. I don't talk specifically just about Massive Bio, I talk about LLS and any other opportunities at the, our local societies and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is, uh, I, I do think that all of these are important tools for our patients that if they are if they are willing and able to try to look for a clinical trial near you, that will be an excellent option, especially in specific situations, all right? Yeah. All the way from the frontline treatment, but especially in the areas where there are things that we're trying to think outside of the box and offering new things to our patients and family members. And I do, I do think that I'm just going to hone in on something here about clinical trials that actually, again, platforms like Massive Bio might be, might potentially be helping the community as a whole in improving this. There's a major, major, major issue with healthcare disparities in, in participation in clinical trials. We are all, uh, again, we have been doing a lot of research during the past 30 years plus in the area of lymphoma 
and leukemias and myeloma and so forth. Malignant hematology in general and transplant. A mm -hmm. lot of that data in which we see our see and treat our patients every single day is based on very specific populations that actually they don't reflect a lot on the folks that we see on our clinic sometimes. You know? Yeah. yeah there's a major uh, lack of participation of minority communities being uh, African American, African Caribbean, uh, Hispanics, Latinos, uh, or other ethnicities, uh, folks, uh, uh, our brothers and sisters from L LGBT communities, uh, uh, patients that very old patients or patients with a lot of comorbidities that actually usually get excluded from clinical trials. Uh, because their renal function is not as pristine, because of the liver function is not as pristine, and what that we are used to treat patients based on data from Olympians, <laughs> if I might say so, right? That's why I was telling you about a bias in this inclusion exclusion criteria. So, right. Ryan, that has not been addressed for a long, a long time, but nowadays there's a lot of effort in doing that by the mm -hmm. NCI, National Cancer Institute the NIH and a lot of other organizations like ASCO and ASH and so forth. So uh, we do need and we do, uh, you know, I always tell my patients to try to consider clinical trials when available, right? Enrollment in clinical trials is very important, as you know. Um, what we see is, you know, the enrollment numbers are, are not very good. You know, they're not very high. So, you know, how, what would you say... At, or um, how can we accomplish a higher enrollment level in terms of trials, and especially in, in lymphoma? Um, you know, how can we do that? What are the ways that we can help patients uh, get enrolled into clinical trials? Couple of thoughts. Uh, I think that, uh, f first of all, I think it's vital, especially for our minority patients uh, and also rural communities and so forth, uh, to provide appropriate, more and appropriate information regarding what is the role of clinical trials in cancer. In mm -hmm. one case right now, talking specifically about lymphomas, what type of, of clinical trials are available? What is a phase one? What is a phase two trial? What is a phase three trial? In layman terms, right? Yeah. Why is it important to participate in clinical trials? Okay. And uh, also, if you know, because there's a lot of mistrust sometimes of so what we call, clear, uh, you know, clinical trials. People think that uh, they're going to be sort of like a completely as a sp experimental subject or quote unquote right. guinea pig or test to person or whatnot, which is definitely not the case. Right. Uh, but we need a lot of education. Uh, yeah. That's where advocacy uh, 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 organizations for patients and uh our local societies and so forth can uh, help us. And we are actually, you know, when local society here in Flasco, Florida, we're taking out some uh, special efforts for that, uh, in that regard. One of them was, so first of all, education about uh, uh, patients that are unfortunately dealing with cancer and their family members, uh, what is important uh, to participate in clinical trials. Also providing resources of how to potentially access uh, information of available clinical trials. One of them could be the massive bio, the another one could be so all again, other uh platforms like even Ash, ASCO, or uh in in the case of malignant hematology, the leukemia lymphoma society and so forth. And there's a lot of other advocacy organizations that actually that help patients with that with this part. Then yeah, let's say that yes, it, let's say the patient and family members have identified a clinical trial also to uh a local uh, advocacy, again, uh, grassroots and advocacy societies or organizations try to facilitate the journey of the patient to that area where the clinical trial is available. And sometimes something that can be transformative and that's something that AI and technology is going to help us out is, you know, I just cannot go there because I'm feeling very sick. I don't have transportation. Yeah, I, know. I don't have anybody. Telemedicine, I think, is going to be transformative as well. Okay, yeah. so that's something if we have telemedicine available in those instances, and there's a lot of uh, regulatory hurdles that have to change a little bit in terms of clinical trials for that, I think potentially participation in clinical trials will improve as well, okay? Mm -hmm. We have better access to the clinical trials. A third of all, yes, uh, for providers, being physicians, nurse practitioners, uh, pharmacists and whatnot, to promote uh, tools such as Massive Bio and other uh, uh, platforms 
uh, to for for the providers to find uh, clinical trials. Okay, yeah. So they just don't have to go themselves in a very 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 busy clinic of right. 30, 40 forty patients that they have to go to clinical trials or golf and so forth. Yes. You know, to have sort of like in, in a way, a place that can curate all this information for them and give the most important based on, a, you know, establish algorithms and for but, uh, give the best options for the patients to, for the patients yeah. to do well. Yep. I agree with that. We, uh, you know, as you know, Massive Bio has created our own artificial intelligence based technology that sorts through all the available clinical trials for patients. And, you know, I think one of the unique parts of our service is that we follow the patient or we take them to that last mile as far as enrollment. You know, we actually schedule, you know, the first appointment for the patient at the enrollment site. So I know there are other services out there. They're wonderful and they help, you know, cancer patients and uh, help in the enrollment of clinical trials. Um, but I think there's some... Uh, operational issues in terms of, you know, yes, the, the patient has received the information about the clinical trial, but that's where the service ends. So I think, you know, we're really focusing on not only providing information to providers, you know, oncologists, physicians, and patients, but also getting that patient through the, la the hurdles at the end there to the physical trial site. So, you know, I know that's where um, the challenges arise. So I'm, I'm glad that we're able to offer that. And then it looks like last question, uh, what to treat, what treatments do clinical trials offer? And you know, you've touched on this, but. Well, I mean, really fast, we could, I think we talk about it, multiple interventions, right? Mm -hmm. There are clinical trials all the way from, uh, medications, right? Uh, medications per se being immunotherapies, uh, classic chemotherapies combined with immunotherapies or, a, what we call targeted treatments, right? That they target a specific, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, targets on those cells, right? One of them is, you know, rituximab or the tafacitumab and so forth, or CAR T cells, right? Or there are other new treatments that are, we call it targeted, but some of them are more like precision medicine treat, right? So for example, I can tell you there's a really weird kind of lymphoma disease that is called Waldstrom's microglobulinemia. Blah, 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 blah. So yeah. Christer, that if they have some specific mutations, we are we know that they uh, respond really well to BTK inhibitors, right? So the other way around in CLL, right, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, if we know that those patients have certain mutations, that is this tp 3 then we don't give chemotherapy. We know that they're going to respond well to these BTK inhibitors or venetoclax or some other thing. So that is more like precision medicine, right? Right. Uh, so uh, different things. There's also interventions, right? In cancer, there's clinical trials for intervention. Let's say like a new type of surgery, surgery or surgical techniques or older uh, or a new type of radiation therapy technique using new radiation uh, machines or treatments or length of therapy or whatnot. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a lot of different. And another one that is very important, there are also trials, clinical trials for palliative care intervention, you know, to, for supportive care that are absolutely important. Well, some of them could be antibiotics, you know, for specifically for some infections that patients, ca uh, cancer patients can have. The other hand could be Things for, you know, improving uh, the control of nausea and vomiting related to chemotherapy or pain or lack of appetite and so forth. And all of them, I mean, you'd be surprised, Fiona, that our nowadays our patients are living longer and better. I mean, no doubt about it in terms of cancer. And a lot of that is due, is due because of these uh, supportive care interventions. Okay. Yeah. So all of them, the spectrum of clinical trials, all of them could be potentially important. 